there. I'd like to talk to you about the second coming. Cut. That was too perfect. Okay. Trying to repeat that one. <laughs> How's that for damaged gods? Welcome to Theater Dark, a video magazine that explores science fiction and horror in the entertainment industry. I'm Debbie Roshan, and I'll be your hostess this evening. In 1974, unsuspecting audiences were introduced to The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, starring Gunnar Hansen. Now Gunnar's back with his latest movie called Freak Show. And here he is with his co-star, Shannon Parsons. Do you believe in fate? Do you believe that there is something out there that controls each of our destinies? Something that pulls the strings in our daily lives and decides which of us will prosper? And which of us will despair? I, uh, I just lucked into it. I was in a drugstore with my Lana Turner sweater. And uh, a fellow came up to me and said, gee, you know, there, there are these guys in town making this movie, and you'd be perfect for the bad guy. So he gave me the uh, phone number of the casting director. I called him up and got the part. And that became the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I auditioned for volunteer work um, in Columbia and started doing volunteer filmmaking. And then there was an ad in the paper and my agent called me and told me about this movie called Freak Show. And so I went and I auditioned for that and I got the role of April. I'm April and I want a candied apple. Those were, that was my first major film, Freak Show. This is my first major film. It's an anthology film. Uh, there are four stories, and Shannon and I play the wraparound. We are the wraparound story for the film. It's 12 o'clock. Time for the sales. Some guys go to a carnival. One of them meets Shannon's character, April, and he wants to go into the freak show, into the sideshow tent. And, and I really hesitate. I don't want to go with him for reasons... Uh, at the end that you will find out. I don't want to go in there. What are you scared of? It's all fake. You don't know that. And we end up going in anyway, and he's a real jerk through the whole thing, and making fun of all the freaks, and not thinking that they're real. That thing looks so cheap. And we get to the end, and I really don't want to tell the very end of the, well, I guess I could. Well, that's all right. Yeah. They have to watch it. <laughs> Very well. Oh, that's true. <laughs> we shouldn't tell. Him. He's the freak master. He's my father in the film. And then I come out at, in the tent and introduce each of the each exhibit, which it becomes a story. So they use this wraparound story to introduce each of the small individual horror stories. I am the freak master. I have on display five tortured souls, each the victim of a most horrid fate. Listen well to their stories and heed the lessons you will hear tonight, lest you or your children become like them. So Gunnar and myself appear throughout and between each story, each freak story. And then at the very end, we have the... The climax of the film. Yes, we are. We are the climax. <laughs> Mosquito just came out two or three weeks ago, which is now in the video stores about the attack of giant six-foot mosquitoes. Um, I'm going to be, just shot a picture called Exploding Angel in Houston, which will be out next year. And then I'll be in Detroit in September doing a picture called Hatred of a Minute, which will be, uh, should be a pretty interesting film. And then, of course, the sequel to... Freesha. <laughs> Freesha. <laughs> right. Um, I ha have been scheduled or have been asked to do a film in October, something about a gangster. A gangster... A wannabe gangster movie um, filmed in Long Island. However, I don't know the title of it, but that was an offer that I received today. Um, but I do a lot of uh, stage performance. 
right now, professional stage performance. I'm about to do community plays. Um, my film experience will rise. I thank you for listening to these tragic people's stories. I hope you've learned something. Hi, I'm Debbie Rashawn, and I'm here at the Washington Monument. Um, I was very curious to find out if the average person, the average man in the street, knows the term Scream Queen. So let's find out. Are you on? Yeah. Great. Hi, can I ask you a question? No? Are you afraid? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Could I ask you a question? No? <laughs> it's hot out, huh? Guys, come over here for a minute. Come on, come on, I got a question for you. Can I ask you a question? Not today, okay. <laughs> Do you know what a scream queen is? Nope. No, sure haven't. No? No. No? 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 No, I'm sorry, we don't. Nope. No. Nope. Do you know what a scream queen is? Uh, like somebody who screams a lot. <laughs> it depends on where she's at. Where she's at? A scream queen? Yeah. Uh, in the PG-13 or the X-rated version? Um, a gay man who yells a lot, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> somebody who, I guess in maybe horror movies, screams really well. I'm thinking maybe like a Jamie Lee Curtis Halloween thing. and Screen Green. That's, uh, that is a girl who, um, who uh, is supposed to act really scared. Uh-huh. And uh, she usually looks like a bimbo. Right. And she usually... Uh, gets killed in a very dramatic way. Uh -huh. Very goes down screaming. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Do you know what a scream queen is? <laughs> uh, I will speak English. I from Ten Tena. We are come from Vietnam. Oh. We just come. No bad movies. I think you are maybe I talk with my sister. You are a movie star. When I come to China, can I stay with you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we say like. So you like Scream Queens? Yeah, right. Good. <laughs> Yay, good. Right. Can you scream for us? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> Will you scream for us? No. Will you scream <laughs> for us? No. Oh, no, come no, on. You, you come on, out. scream. You can shut Anybody out. scream? <laughs> We are in the parking lot to the Washington Monument. We are no longer near the Washington Monument because security asked us to leave. I don't know why. So in the meantime, while we're getting back to the studio, check out this interview with Brink Stevens. Vicky. Victoria, wake up, honey. Come on. Time to open your eyes. Wake up, bitch. I went to Scripps Institute of Oceanography. I was getting my master's degree there, studying uh, vision and seals. I really wanted to do dolphin communication. And ended up getting my master's degree and leaving there, moving on to Hollywood and becoming an actress. Please look at me. Know that I'm alive. Please. A pretty one, aren't we? It was a total, complete accident that I became an actress. I was walking by a door and it was a casting office and they said you come in here show us what you got and the next day they put me in a movie as an extra but um, I've since done like two dozen starring roles in films I was probably an extra in about a hundred movies and I eventually earned the title of screen queen <laughs> I finished a film last summer called Mommy, and that should be out already on video. And then um, I did a movie with Roger Corman called Droid Gunner, where I play an alien cat creature. That'll be out in late summer. It probably already is out. It's a Showtime premiere movie at first, and then it comes out on video. I know it sounds crazy, but it's only a dream, right? Yes, that's right. I'm doing a co-production deal with Hong Kong on a film called Pandora. It's a martial arts movie where I play kind of a Modesty Blaze character, and it's possible we'll be shooting it in Hong Kong at the end of the year. I also have a book out called Hot Blood 5, Seeds of Fear. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I wrote the introduction on this, on why sex and horror go together. And then in October, I'll be in Hot Blood 6 with a short story called Jacking In. It's a cyber sex shocker. <laughs>
I had the first issue of my comic book, Brink of Eternity, has come out already on Chaos Comics. And I'm presently working on a three-issue miniseries, Brink of Destruction. Boris Vallejo just finished the first cover for that. Julie Bell's doing the second. I recently modeled for both of them in Pennsylvania in my new costume. And I'm co-writing it along with Todd Kaler, my same interior artist, Mike Holloman. And it's just going to be a dynamite series. It starts with the end of the world and goes on from there. Well, I've been buried alive, and I wake up in the coffin. It's black inside, but I can still see. And I can hear my heart beating in my ears like a drum. I scream, but no one can hear me because I'm so far underground. And it's cold, deathly cold and quiet. I scream and then I claw at the coffin lid until my fingernails are broken and torn. Teenage Exorcist was the third script that I had written and sold and one of two movies that I saw that was produced. But I'm currently working on a sequel to Haunting Fear, Haunting Fear 2 Buried Nightmares, in which I reprise my character Vicky, who goes totally nutso once again and chases everyone with a big butcher knife. <laughs> and then I'm also working on a romantic ghost story, a big budget movie called The Returning. Ingrid? 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 Glad to see you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> in the past 10 years, there's been a boom in the comic book industry of independent publishers, one of which is Dan Parsons, artist, creator, and writer of Atos the Eagle. Hello, my name is Dan Parsons, and uh, I'm the artist and creator of uh, Atos the Eagle and a few other characters that are in this five part series that I'm working on. <laughs> There are these um, sort of ghouls which are mysteriously abducting the citizens of New York uh, every night, okay? They're coming from somewhere we don't know. They come from various places, like they walk out of the East River. And one scene is where they abduct these uh, teenagers at a party. And uh, this kind of thing. Anyway, no one knows where they come from, and everyone in the uh, city has prevailing views on uh, um, where, you know, what's the reason behind this. So the three characters in my story, um, they're just as much plagued by the mystery of, you know, who are these creatures as everyone else. Usually I start uh, by laying out the basic rhythm of what I'm drawing. Um, in this case, I'm gonna draw a figure standing. I would say it's a mixture of sort of a, like late 60s creepy, eerie type feel, you know, with the horror aspect, and then I throw in a lot of action, you know, because I come from, you know, someone who, who reads a lot of, like, um, old Captain America and Daredevil. So I like to mix different elements together. My concentration is more or less in the atmosphere of, of the book, and creating a dark atmosphere, you know, with very intricate battle sequences and like in graveyards and like with a lot of mood and I look at it as an artist and I get become more and more looking at it as an artist um, you know and less as a, a writer. The series is based mostly around Night Warrior actually and uh, Night Warrior in the series is an aging homeless man uh, during the day who becomes young at night 
Okay, and how he's able to do this is described in the second issue, the origin sequence, where we go back into his life as a scientist, uh, James Lazarus, working on a formula to stop the aging process. Um, as he's about to perfect this aging process, um, these industrial espionage spies come into his office, they, kill, they tr attempt to kill him, and um, they destroy his laboratory and uh, steal his formula. Well, in order to try to save his life, he injects himself, okay, with the uh, formula, but it hadn't been, um, you know, completely you know, perfected yet. As far as Atos goes, Atos being like sort of the powerhouse of my universe, he, the way I have him portrayed is being sort of an ex-superhero, um, where he used to be sort of the benefactor of the public and would help aid people, but now he sort of turned his back on the people, and he's a little bit at conflict with the, the government, and he lives alone on, our, on this island, you know, out in the middle of the ocean. It's on a huge rock, and he sort of set himself apart from the world. Um, everything, I try to explain everything. If he can fly, I explain how he can fly. By use of, like, current theories and, and um, superconductors, and, and ultra light alloys and so on. You know, I, I use theories that are prevailing, um, you know, theories in physics and quantum physics and that kind of thing, which, which in theory could possibly happen. And the same thing with Night Warrior. Um, Night Warrior, he injects himself with this formula which perpetually stimulates the part of your cell which is, generates energy for cellular um, growth, which is the mitochondria of the cell. It's very technical, but a chemist uh, and I worked it up, actually. And in theory, it's true. And if you were to, in, if you were to constantly stimulate the mitochondria of a cell, it would never age, okay? Because you would have no breakdown of the other parts of the cell. So, you know, I try to explain everything in in really realistic terms. And one thing when I was growing up that I never really liked Superman that much, or all these heroes who had like these cosmic powers with no, you know, there's no grounding in science. So I go to all lengths. Even the zombies, um, although they are, in appearance, the classic horror zombies, and which I love, you know, to death. Um, they're actually biosynthetic sort of creatures, and I go to great lengths to describe the composition of this. Um, biosynthetic nutrient that replaced the blood in their system and um, they have a microprocessor which is attached and works with their parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Um, you can look for not only Atos 2, Children of the Graves, but um, Atos 3, uh, the final chapter, and that'll be the wrap-up of the five-part series that I initially began. Um, the, the reason that everything is called Atos from now on is because of just sort of a, a simple marketing thing where people need that name recognition for uh, one product, it seems like. So although the, all the characters are going to be involved in the storyline, all the books will be called Atos from now on. And Atos 3 will be the conclusion of the original Children of the Graves crossover, as it's referred to sometimes. Um, after that, I plan to continue Atos um, indefinitely, um, and I intend on introducing a new character, this character Harpy, and she'll be a backup feature in, I'm hoping, Atos number four, which I've actually already started uh, writing. Um, I'm thinking about also maybe bringing on some new artists f to do the Atos portion, and I was going to concentrate on doing the, the Harpy and uh, spend more time doing business. I wrote a story called The Corpse, which I'm, I'm gonna, I really wanna get that one in, and it's actually about a teenage kid who kills himself, okay? And uh, who doesn't quite make it to heaven or hell. I know this has been done, but uh, he is forced to live on Earth only to die every day. Every, at, at, so, like, um, basically every day when the sun comes up, he dies. Well, I can tell you that it's, it's a serious uphill battle. And, and particularly lately with all the distributor wars and, you know, 
Andromeda got out of business and, you know, whatever, Heroes World getting taken over by Marvel and, you know, it's a constant struggle. The smaller you are, the harder you, it is for you because of the, um, the printing costs are so high per unit. Um, I would not recommend it to somebody unless they're like completely insane like me. Like me. My name is Dan Parsons. I'm the uh, artist and creator of the Atos to Eagle series. Um, I recently came up with this t-shirt design. Um, this is a character. Her name is Harpy. She'll be introduced into Atos to Eagle number four. Um, I have the shirts. They're $10. They're 100% cotton. It's a half-tone design from an original ink wash um, drawing that I did. Um, if you'd like to order one, I have some here. And what you'd have to do is um, basically just send $10 plus $1.50 uh, shipping and handling to Orphan Underground Comics, um, 4120 Colby Road, Baltimore, Maryland, 21208. And if you'd like to order any of the comic books or um, if you'd like any information um, about the series or uh, other merchandise, right now just t-shirts and uh, prints, uh, you can call 410-484-0277. And um, I'd be glad to ship something out to you. Um, the comic books, they're $2. If you get them directly through me, um, retail costs two fifty dollars usually. Um, and I just charge a dollar for shipping and handling, so $3 per book and pretty much includes everything. And uh, I'm going to the post office all the time, so, you know, no problem. Suicides must involve proper precautions, for a suicide will not rest easy in his grave. The suicide, totally unhallowed and restless in death, will wander abroad, sometimes aided by those who were close to the person in life. There exist certain beings whose very lives seem bound by invisible chains to the supernatural. They crave solitude, to be alone, and to dream. Their imaginations are so developed that their visions reach beyond those of most people. David Gray's personality was thus mysterious. Gray's researches into the superstitions of Satanism and vampirism made him particularly susceptible to an encounter he once experienced. Once, in the village of Cortempierre, an epidemic claimed 11 lives. The doctors gave a medical name to it, but the people believed otherwise. sensations. I have found one for you.
You've seen them in Vampire Vixens from Venus. You've seen them in Beauty School. You've seen them in their birthday suit. Here's J.J. North and Theresa Lynn. All right, remember timing. Get him at the peak of excitement. I'll be the main exciter. Ome, you stand behind and drain. Shirley, you watch and fondle and learn. I'm ready. Well, first off, um, I couldn't hold down a normal job. I was too much of a ham. And I guess when you tap dance on the boss's desk, that means you're fired. So I had to find an outlet that um, I could express myself, and this is the one that I found. Oh. Hey, what are you doing? Don't touch that remote. And I myself had gotten a slow start. I took some classes in college and just liked it too much. And buddied up with Theresa, got in a lot of trouble with her, and here we are today, starting more trouble. <laughs> uh, hey, what the hell's going on? What are you doing? What are you doing? If we go on the same audition together, yeah. somehow, some way, they end up picking the both of us. If there's more than one role, they'll end up picking the both of us. And it's happened that there was one role that we were both up for, and they created another one so that they could supply the both of us because they wanted us to both be in the movie. They had approached JJ. Uh -huh. Go ahead and tell them. Uh, I was approached by Depraved Productions, and we were going to film. We were going to start filming, and I had mentioned my friend Theresa, and she auditioned. She went up and auditioned. They liked her a lot. How could they not? And they wrote a part for her. And it's happened many times, and just even with just our mod regular modeling work, where I'm offered to do a poster, she's offered to do a calendar. They meet one of us, and they decide that okay, Maybe you can two bring. Would yeah, would be a better idea. So. And it works. I guess it's true they say if you hang out long enough, you start to look like each other and pick up each other's mannerisms. Nuh-uh. So, <laughs> All right, so, maybe. So, I mean, a lot of people think that we look a lot alike and they like the fact that we have similar features and they want us to be together in things. So it's, plus we're best friends and we yes. have a great time. It, it's, I don't consider this to be work, to be quite honest. I'm making a nice living off having a lot of fun mm -hmm. and hanging out with my best friends. Shirley? Kill him and use the note conversion turn setting. <laughs>